Thanks for listening to this. I've uh, entitled this talk, The Active Shooter Problem, but it could as easily been the active truck driver problem or the active knifer problem. But it's a security database using blockchain technologies. And there's a story in academia, and that is, is that there was these islands in the Pacific separated uh, by hundreds of miles, but there was this one species of monkey that occupied all of them. And they, these, this monkey uh, species got its food from, after the uh, tide washed out, there would be shrimp left in the sand. So on all the islands, all these thousands of monkeys for hundreds of years waited till the tide went out, went out, got their shrimp, and went back into the forest and cleaned off the, uh, the sand off the shrimp and then ate them. One monkey was coming back over some rocks and his shrimp fell out of his mouth into a tidal pool. So he stopped, reached, grabbed it out, looked at it, and he noticed there was no sand on it. From that moment on, that one monkey did that. Now, as weeks go by, other monkeys uh, are nearby when he's doing this and they see him doing it. And so, on an average, so about one more monkey per week. Some weeks might have been three, some it might have been one, some it might have been two. So on average of two a week, uh, monkeys started doing this. Once they do it, the food is so much cleaner and so much easier, they don't go back to the old way. So this continues up a graph at about 45 degrees, one, uh, two monkeys per week for about 50 weeks. So, when you get to 50 weeks, all of a sudden, something comes over the entire colonies, even though they're separated. And from that moment on, all the colonies of monkeys start washing their shrimp out in the tidal pools. And that's called the 100th monkey uh, effect. And that's the reason I'm doing it, to get the idea out there. You know, the fact of the matter is, is the risk analysis viewpoint on this isn't getting out there. I don't know why, you know. Maybe it's because people that understand risk modeling aren't proposing solutions or people don't know how to, you know, how to conceptualize risk. It's hard to say. But if you think about risk as being uh, just a simple product of, uh, of the loss of an asset, times the odds of its occurrence. So, uh, you know, say a vulnerability would cost a company a million bucks, and on average, they might face it about once a year. That's how you rank risk like that. And it's very easy. But for some reason, it's just not done coming. <coughs> so the need for this database is illustrated. If we think, take a look at uh, uh, this recent uh, Florida shooter, he was on psychoactive drugs. He'd been turned in by, like, everybody um, multiple times to both FBI, Sheriff's Department, local police. Uh, I think they might have even called a newspaper or two. Uh, and also, he was on psychoactive drugs, which always uh, puts you at risk for ab aberrant behavior. Now, my question is, should he have been able to buy ammo? And I think most of us agree that, no, if you think back, it's not just, it's not just retrospect, you know, in hindsight's 2020. I know that might be an argument, but <clears throat> hopefully I'll uh, address that. Think, uh, think back to, um, the Pulse nightclub, uh, killer Omar Mateen. Uh, remember, uh, Pulse nightclub was, uh, in, uh, June of 2016, in which uh, uh, 49 were killed and 53 were wounded. High, high casualty rate. Uh, he was also interviewed by the FBI. Uh, and his father was an FBI informant. And 
uh, his his father has been on the record saying, "Hey, I told him this guy, he's crazy, man." <laughs> but uh, it, but it, my point is, it'd be hard for the average person to have that much of an in uh, as an FBI informant. Uh, think back to uh, April 15, 2013, the Boston bombings. Tamara Lynn and uh, Johar Sarneyev, they'd been interviewed by the FBI as well. Uh, the Boston bomber, three were killed and 16 people lost limbs. But remember, several hundred were injured, injured pretty badly. And uh, with Tamara Lynn and Johar, the funny thing is, is they were the prime suspect in another murder which I didn't even know about, but let me read this from a CNN website. A lot of people forgot this. The FBI, which had been cleared of any wrongdoing, of course, says Sarnayev was about to sign a statement implicating both uh, him and his brother Sarnayev in the murders uh, when he was killed. So that would have been Yohar, wouldn't it? <clears throat> but that's uh, and that's from the NBC news site with a, a link underneath here. <clears throat> the uh, New Mexico shooter that did the uh, Aztec High School shooting in uh, end of uh, last year. Uh, he had been previously investigated by the FBI for online comments about planning a mass shooting. So he was interviewed by the FBI, too, with a link down below. And that's from CNN. Uh, the Charleston uh, church shooting, Dylan Roof, the racist guy that uh, killed nine in an African-American uh, Methodist church in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, he was... Uh, they did a background check on him, even though he was flagged as a, you know, as a white supremacist and all, you know, under the almost uh, unimaginable scrutiny, and it was classified as a supremacist. Um, he was able to buy buy a gun prior to the mass murders. So I think we could see. I could go on with this too, but I think we can see that our current system is letting a lot of stuff slip through the cracks. Now, I'm not here to judge anything. You know, I'm not saying this is good or this is bad, but I'm just saying the current uh, way of doing this is letting a lot of things slip through the cracks. So this database would be composed of publicly appointed security experts. But I should say before I go any further that this is not a government, federal government uh, thing, but it's a uh, it's something that uh, a defense contractor, for example, this would be so easy <laughs> to the guys building our uh, F-35 jets and uh, our advanced drones. Um, but it would not be a government database. They would the uh, the contractor who took the contract on would have to. Uh, you know, have civilians pass background checks to be employed. I think, I think, you know, the, the, the board running this and it would be totally anonymous, like a skunk works project inside a contractor. Totally anonymous. Very important. It has to be transparent and does not owe any allegiance, uh, to the company sponsoring. It's got to be totally free of influence. <coughs> And these will be the security experts, and they'll come up with a uh, risk profile based on, um, you know, profile characteristics. They'll put that in a risk uh, assessment database. They'll, unlike the credit score that you get, they will transparently calculate this, <coughs> and uh, it'll be linked to users by a anonymous bio uh, metrically linked national risk card so but the the biometric has no relation to an individual's identity so it's anonymous in that but it does tie to an individual's uh biometric seizure whether it's uh thumb 
print or facial rec or whatever. Now, if you had a database like that, what about blockchain would make it good at this? Well, there's, I, you know, I just thought of the main things, but blockchain would in, ensure the integrity of the edits in this database. It would ensure the identity of the editors and those of you that know blockchain, which we're going to review here in a second, totally know what I'm saying. It would be a private and distributed network. And because of this architecture, it would be impossible to hack. And also, these records would have rock solid chain of custodies for uh, the threat matrix and the risk factors that were being uh, tracked. And also, uh, one of uh, one of the people that would be on this list of security experts, in fact, probably the first one that would come to mind is a, a cryptologist named uh, Bruce Schneider. And he's uh, written the textbook Applied Cryptography and things like that. But he has always talked about security is always, and this is true if you think about it, security has always been a matter of focusing limited resources onto uh, the most likely threats. That's what, by definition, uh, cybersecurity is and, uh, and IT security. <clears throat> you are taking limited resources and you're maximizing uh, the, de the, the uh, decrease of the threat. You have to get maximum uh, in you know maximum reduction of the threat for every dollar spent <clears throat> and because of this uh, Schneider has always been a fan of targeted uh, operations in fact uh, NSA was made famous not for their uh, you know wiretapping of everyone and things like that but they have a a, a special division called tailored access operations and Really, even this is the approach that should be taken is um, is tailored access. Uh, the problem with widespread surveillance is it doesn't work on a lot of levels. Uh, also, besides the uh, obvious one, it's counter it's, you know the function of security, but also constitutionally, it's never been settled if. Is it uh, legal to collect electronic records without probable cause? And it's never that question has never been fully answered, uh, and it's never really been challenged effectively. Uh, they've been doing it for a while, but it just hasn't, uh, you know, got to the Supreme Court and stuff. But um, Schneider, of course, is uh, besides being a textbook author for cryptology, he's also uh, well known for his uh, cryptogram email newsletter and uh, he's also noted for creating the term security theater uh, to describe ineffective bulk data uh, analysis and his uh, current book data and goliath as you can imagine is a, also uh, he's an advocate for targeted access rather than mass collection So, in conclusion, the uh, road is a national risk organization, uh, individual database uh, to address the problem of these threats walking around. And um, road stands for risk-oriented uh, data entry, which is the name of the application. And you know, in conclusion. Blockchain would be perfect because it would keep the database from being hacked. <clears throat> um, blockchain's gotten kind of a bad rap because um, people, you know, there's been some high profile cases of, of uh, cryptocurrency being hacked. Um, there was a case in Japan where uh, it's thought uh, China or Taiwan 
or North Korea hacked about uh, $500 million worth of Bitcoin, which would probably uh, by now be worth about half a million. <laughs> just, just kidding, but it's gone down a lot. Uh, and then um, uh, Steve Wozniak lost about 80, I think 85,000. Look that up. I think he lost about 85,000 in uh, Bitcoin due to a fraudulent credit card being used. You know, as long and you know, remember, Bitcoin is just a key on a server somewhere, and since it's just data sitting there, it's subject to being hacked. Okay, we're going to review some concepts here. creates a unique digital fingerprintable data. The digital fingerprintable data is called digest or message digest or simply hash. Hash algorithm is primarily used for comparison purpose, not for encryption. Many secure hash algorithms have three basic characteristics. 1. Secure. Resulting hash or digest cannot be reversed to determine original data. Hash algorithm is not reversible, is one-way function. Giving a digest, you cannot get the original data. 2. Fixed size. Giving a hash algorithm you will get fixed size digests, no matter how original data vary in length. Short or long data sets will produce the same size digest. 3. Unique. Two different data sets cannot produce the same digest. Hash algorithm is commonly used for passwords. Take Twitter as an example. Today I want to see What's going on with Donald Trump? I needed to log in first. My username, Sunny Sun, my password, ABC123. When I click Submit, both my username and password would be sent to Twitter database. But before my password is sent to the database, it is hashed to a digest. Let's assume Twitter use SHA-256 as their hash algorithm, then my password digest would be 256 bit long. You might say, hey, your password is too easy, is it too risky? You are right. How about, I love you princess? Believe me, it's not a good password either. But for the sake of learning, is okay at this moment. A new password, a new digest, of course. But the digest size is still 256 bit long. Therefore, the same hash algorithm always produces the same sized digest. Keep in mind, all password in Twitter database or any secure database are stored in the form of a digest. They should never be stored in plain text in any database. Every time you log in, your password is hashed into a digest, which is then compared against the one stored in a database. That's why we see hash algorithm is mainly used for comparison purpose, not for encryption. You might say the hash algorithm is not reversible and our password are is stored in a database in the form of a digest. But why our password are still hacked. Well, to find out why, 
is another story in another video. Thank you very much. And see you next time. What a, what a cliffhanger, huh? Uh, I'll put the links to this underneath. So uh, you can go over there and check it out if you like. This one's actually on uh, on uh, block currency or uh, block blockchain. Want to know more about blockchain technology? You should take online blockchain courses on Udemy. They've got fresh new courses, all taught by expert instructors. Blockchains are incredibly popular nowadays. But what is a blockchain? How do they work? What problems do they solve? And how can they be used? Like the name indicates, a blockchain is a chain of blocks that contains information. We're going to pause that there. And uh, while I'm thinking about it, um, what did, did he mention what it's called when two different input texts create the same hash? That's called a collision. How about uh, what is a database of pre-computed hashes that are used to speed uh, cracking of a network password hash? What's that called? It's a rainbow table. And what do you, what do you call a defense against a password crack? using a rainbow table? The answer is that's a password salt. Back to our show. This technique was originally described in 1991 by a group of researchers and was originally intended to timestamp digital documents so that it's not possible to backdate them or to tamper with them, almost like a notary. However, it went by mostly unused until it was adapted by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 to create the digital cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Now, a blockchain is a distributed ledger that is completely open to anyone. They have an interesting property. Once some data has been recorded inside a blockchain, it becomes very difficult to change it. So how does that work? Well, let's take a closer look at a block. Each block contains some data, the hash of the block, and the hash of the previous block. The data that is stored inside a block depends on the type of blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain, for example, stores the details about a transaction in here, such as the sender, receiver, and the amount of coins. A block also has a hash. You can compare a hash to a fingerprint. It identifies a block and all of its contents and it's always unique, just as a fingerprint. Once a block is created, its hash is being calculated. Changing something inside the block will cause the hash to change. So in other words, hashes are very useful when you want to detect changes to blocks. If the fingerprint of a block changes, it no longer is the same block. The third element inside each block is the hash of the previous block. And this effectively creates a chain of blocks, and it's this technique that makes a blockchain so secure. Let's take an example. Here we have a chain of three blocks. As you can see, each block has a hash and the hash of the previous block. So block number three points to block number two, and number two points to number one. Now the first block is a bit special. It cannot point to previous blocks because, well, it's the first one. We call this block the Genesis block. Now, let's say that you tamper with the second block. This causes the hash of the block to change as well. In turn, that will make block 3 and all following blocks invalid because they no longer store a valid hash of the previous block. So changing a single block will make all following blocks invalid. But using hashes is not enough to prevent tampering. Computers these days are very fast and can calculate hundreds of thousands of hashes per second. You could effectively tamper with a block and recalculate all the hashes of other blocks to make your blockchain valid again. So to mitigate this, blockchains have something that is called proof of work. It's a mechanism that slows down the creation of new blocks. In Bitcoin's case, 
it takes about 10 minutes to calculate the required proof of work and add a new block to the chain. This mechanism makes it very hard to tamper with the blocks because if you tamper with one block, you'll need to recalculate the proof of work for all the following blocks. So the security of a blockchain comes from its creative use of hashing and the proof of work mechanism. But there is one more way that blockchains secure themselves and that is by being distributed. Instead of using a central entity to manage the chain, blockchains use a peer-to-peer -peer network and everyone is allowed to join. When someone joins this network, he gets a full copy of the blockchain. The node can use this to verify that everything is still in order. Now let's see what happens when someone creates a new block. That block is sent to everyone on the network. Each node then verifies the block to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. And if everything checks out, each node adds this block to their own blockchain. All the nodes in this network create consensus. They agree about what blocks are valid and which aren't. Blocks that are tampered with will be rejected by other nodes in the network. So to successfully tamper with a blockchain, you'll need to tamper with all the blocks on the chain, redo the proof of work for each block, and take control of more than 50% of the peer-to-peer -peer network. Only then will your tampered block become accepted by everyone else. So this is almost impossible to do. Blockchains are also constantly evolving. One of the most recent developments is the creation of smart contracts. These contracts are simple programs that are stored on the blockchain and can be used to automatically exchange coins based on certain conditions. More on smart contracts in a later video. The creation of blockchain technology piqued a lot of people's interest. Soon others realized that this technology could be used for other things like storing medical records, creating a digital notary, or even collecting taxes. So now you know what a blockchain is, how it works on a basic level, and what problems it solves. Want to learn how you can implement a simple blockchain in JavaScript? Then check out this video here. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Uh, the link to that guy's site's below, and you can go over there and subscribe or give him some likes or something. Um, now, he talks significantly about um, the proof of work uh, in crypto. Now, the proof of work now with blockchains, I mean, that was the thing, if you recall, it used to be uh, in today's computing power, relatively cheap to mine. That's why they call it uh, cryptocurrency mining is because it's based on the security of this uh, proof of work and the work has to verify that the computer cycles were, uh, you know, expended. And as time goes on, uh, this proof of, you know, to actually mine a Bitcoin becomes more and more uh, computer resource intensive. This won't be an issue uh, when you're not actually applying it to uh, currency. And uh, in fact, it can be set where it doesn't cause a scaling problem at all in the database. And uh, it can be used at a lower level to uh, prevent uh, server attacks like distributed denial of service and the distribution of spam attacks. And uh, and it's uh, this proof of work is not needed in uh, a database like this because uh, you don't have to prove the currency was produced. So that's, that's why it's totally different. So, you know, surprisingly, there's uh, card scanners all over the place now. And 99% of the infrastructure uh, were is already in place. Like uh, this bomber, uh, it, you know, I, 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 I uh, use the example of buying ammo or buying guns in the uh, national... Uh, gun database, but also uh, it, it was reported that the uh, bomber in Florida had um, bought most of his uh, 
things to produce a bomb at Home Depot. So if you're scanning stuff at Home Depot, you might get an alert. Doo, doo, you know, just everything's like that exactly as it is now. The only person who knows any difference at all is someone who, who once, once they put it on, you know, they say, okay, put it on my account, start tracking. Once they get into ratios of things that could be used to produce a bomb, they're asked to produce their security card to continue. You and I, with no, you know, we're not on psychotropic drugs. We're, we haven't uh, made public threats to people lately. You know, heck, if you're like me, I don't even think I have a parking ticket for the last 20 years, you know. <clears throat> so, uh, we would be just continue buying whatever, but somebody that might have had some uh, red flags on that would be flagged for buying the materials to produce a bomb. <clears throat> um, there'd be a lot of ways to make this really, really secure. A lot of uh, what I was explaining this to a student the other day, a lot of what makes uh, networks so hackable is they're so interoperative. This would be an isolated, uh, distributed network, but it would be isolated. And that means you don't have to stick with uh, like Cat5 cable or, or any of that stuff, you know. You could take a computer, uh, you know, like a board and just put it in a stripped down chassis and have all kind of different uh, connectors and stuff that you wouldn't have. It's not in commercial production. <clears throat> You could even uh, do your own networking protocols and stuff and your own data storage on the disk. And that is, you know, even though everything today is, you know, is, it's amazing. Is this, well, another thing, this network would, of course, be air-gapped. You know, it wouldn't be, it would be an air-gapped network. <clears throat> but actually, this is actually, you know, despite the bad rep that uh, cybersecurity gets, this would actually be pretty easy to to uh, deploy extremely secure if you're not really worried about interoperability. And um, you could even go as far as once you pick your experts like Bruce Schneider and, uh, you know, the other, other security experts, you could put the um, secure room uh, near your expert and, uh, you know, give them uh, secure ways of getting in and things like that. And uh, in that database, as a group, they would come up with, they'd work on things like threat profiles, uh, threat indexing, and all their uh, changes to the data entry system would be by consensus. <clears throat> that being said, and even though this doesn't personally identify people, uh, no one ever said this was going to be easy. And um, I'm not going to say that this uh, would not necessitate some legislation. But I would just point out that uh, the people put a lot more than this up on, <laughs> on social media, a lot more information than this. And remember, this information isn't personally identifiable. And, uh, and, and, and being a public company, uh, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be under the same restrictions of the government, and, but we could also make sure that our employees, you know, did what they're supposed to, unlike a government job where you can never fire them. You'd have to be really agile to make sure you had the right talent in place. You'd have to easily be able to pick up talent. <clears throat> but that's, you know, that I think it's worth it. The thing is that this uh, database would use uh, public and semi-public data, not personal data, to track all this. Um, we've already given not just that data, but personal data up for um, social media like Facebook and things. So I don't think it's, uh, I think for the return on it, uh, I don't know if I would advocate it, but I would say an argument could be made for it. And like to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, thanks for watching.